All right, so let's uh, continue our discussion of measurements and uncertainty, building up a couple more uh, preparatory ideas. This is measurement and uncertainty video two. Uh, last time, we spoke about actual value versus measured value, uh, error, uncertainty, range, accuracy, and precision. This time, we'll talk about systematic versus random error. Didn't squeeze that in. Uh, we'll talk about how you specify or communicate the uncertainty. Again, when you give someone a number, say, I got this number in the lab, you said you needed it, and you paid me to get this number, and they say, well, how good is it? How much can I trust it? I mean, it's not exact. Uh, how much is it off? And there's three ways to communicate this. One way is just by writing the number. You'll see the number of significant figures and the number of decimal places. That's a simple way, and that's often what we'll do. But in lab also, you can be a little more careful and do a little more work, and you can specify the absolute uncertainty, which we'll define, and the relative uncertainty. And you can go back and forth between these two fairly easily. But it's good to know the difference. So let's go now as a quick review and talk about systematic versus random error. Okay, remember the difference between error and uncertainty. There's some actual value that we're looking for out there in the mystery world. We don't know it, we can't really know it. We can just know our, our measurements. Um, we take a lot of measurements and out of that we analyze it however we do and come up with a value, a measured value. When we give that to someone, we say, well, I'm not exactly sure, um, but that's the value because I got a range of values, but this is the value that I would say we should work with, plus some uncertainty and minus some uncertainty. Okay? So that was that of the possible values. Uh, we can't know how much error there is, but we can know that there are things that contribute to the error. So we talked about a uh, Olympic Archer, uh, turning out for the team. And we said A was accurate because it was close to the target value, which here in this case we do know. Uh, B was bad because it's all over the map, spread out and away from the value. And C was consistent and precise. So precision means that the values that you get are close together. Now granted, C is farther away from the bullseye, the target, but you can train C. So there's something about these results here that you can just say, oh, you're up and up and to the right, bring it down. So it's consistent, but it's a little high and over. And that kind of, uh, that way of being off, having your numbers off, uh, is called a uh, systematic. error. So here you're consistent, but you're consistently off. Maybe your values are consistently high or consistently low. And so you have to think about it. Uh, if you don't know where the value is, you won't know that until someone comes along and does good data and they bring it over here and say, yeah, you, you know, they do it over here and you think, oh, well, your numbers are a little high. Uh, and so you look at it and go, oh, that's because of whatever factor it is, thermal factors, maybe the temperature um, is causing your numbers to be high, whatever it is, materials you're using, uh, air resistance, humidity, whatever the case is. So if you're consistently off, you can adjust them if you can argue and explain what's causing that. Um, so systematic errors you look for and, uh, and you can adjust. So, Suppose we do adjust that, make that adjustment, we bring those over here, and you go, wow, that's pretty good, you know? Over here. And now they're still consistent, they're still precise, they're still close together, right? But they are still a little bit different. And that is something that no matter how hard you try, you're still giving this little bit of variation. And so we call that a random error. It's something we expect but you can't avoid. I mean, if you can, then do it. You know, but maybe because of your equipment or whatever the case. So without going into too much more, there's this idea of systematically constantly being a little high. Oh, okay, that's because of this. I'll adjust that. 
and we're better, or we're low. Random error, there's going to be some standard fluctuation. And exactly what all that is depends on your experiments. So now you know those terms. Systematic versus a random error. I hope that's clear. So now let's talk about communicating uncertainty. Okay, three ways to communicate uncertainty. One way is just by writing the numbers. Okay, there's two things, two things that you should look at. Um, the number of significant figures, sig figs, sometimes SF, people write it so much because it's a mistake people make. And uh, in this class, you want to just be reasonable with this, number of sig figs, um, versus the number of decimal places, which is a different thing. And often, it, this one is often neglected in textbooks, uh, but it's really quite important, number of decimal places. So what are sig figs, significant figures? Well, just best by example, you can say words you may be familiar with. 825 has three figures that are, that are given, significant figures. Usually, the last one here is the one that you're not quite sure about. Otherwise, you go further. So uh, that one's your uncertain one. Uh, here, you've got 5.902 is 4. 0 0.12 only has 2. This 0 doesn't count. Uh, 0 0.0081 only has 2 because these zeros don't count. 10.8 has 3. That 0 does count. Uh, another example, 300. Now, many, many textbooks will write this. They're expecting you to work with three sig figs. Why? Just, I guess it's easy, but it, it keeps you from learning this. So they might write 300, and they mean that to be three sig figs. Well, as written, it's either one or it's unclear. Um, so the way to make this very clear, the number of sig figs, is always to write things in scientific notation. So if I translate into 3 times 10 to the 2, the number out here has one sig fig. If I want to communicate two sig figs, I write 3.0 times 10 to the 2. Still 10 to the 2 because it's 300. But the point zero adds another significant figure. And it says, I'm more certain here in 3.0 than I am with 3. If I'm even more certain, then it's 3.00. And that's three sig figs. So just be clear. If you write it in scientific notation, it'll be clear how many sig figs you have. And we'll talk about using that in a minute. Now, what's wrong with these numbers? The more you work in uh, your physics class and engineering classes, you should kind of cringe when you see numbers without units. But I'm just showing this. So maybe they're meters, maybe they're seconds, maybe they're kilograms, maybe they're kilogram meter per second squared, whatever. Newtons, etc. So those are sig figs. So we'll come back to that. Number of decimal places. Okay, number of decimal places, pretty clear. But there's an important point here. It's easy, but you just need to be made aware of it. 48, of course, has no decimal places. There's nothing after the point. In other countries, they use a comma here. But for us, we need a point. Here we got one decimal place after the point. Here we don't have any. Here we have two, etc. So uh, let's take, we'll take a look at this. Right? Um, why, why does this matter? Well, for instance, if I'm measuring lengths, okay, if I'm measuring lengths, and I'm using, we'll talk about this more in a minute, this meter stick, but it's only marked in centimeters. Okay, so I might say I've got 53 centimeters, and whatever I'm doing, I'm adding to this uh, other measurement. Maybe I'm measuring something, uh, some amp walk that 53 centimeters, and then I use this guy which has my centimeters, and then it's the centimeters broken into 10 divisions, or millimeters, right? So then I can maybe add 13.2, uh, 13.2. So then that's 13.2 centimeters. Now if I saw that, I'd say, wait, clearly, a couple things. Different instruments were being used. This one was good only to the centimeter. This was good to tenth of a centimeter. 
So my answer would be, let's see, 66.2 centimeters, but this one, I don't know if it's point whatever. So I can't really count that one. We'll talk about that later. Okay, but that's why it's sort of important. In terms of sig figs, this has got two sig figs. This has got three sig figs. If I were to have that, this all of a sudden has four sig figs. But still, this one is only known to within a centimeter. And this one is measured with a device to within a tenth of a centimeter. So we'll make that distinction here uh, later when we propagate these things. Okay, so be aware of the number of sig figs and the decimal places, and we'll see how you use them. Okay, the other ways that you can specify your uncertainty are absolute and relative. When I would say absolute and relative error, you will hear it's really an uncertainty that you're talking about, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So let's do that uh, to really they will go back and forth. So we have an absolute uncertainty and sometimes people will give it a symbol. Often I've seen a lowercase e, which is like error, so maybe it should be u, um, and a relative uncertainty, which is often given a letter r, but uh, don't worry about that right now. So an absolute uncertainty is saying, here's my number, for example, uh, we got, and I'm going to use it this way, 100 um, centimeters as our result, 100 centimeters, okay, and, uh, sorry, I made that uh, but, it was a little fuzzy, you know, getting that last centimeter. I'm not sure. Maybe it was 101, maybe it was 199. So I could have a range, say, of 101 to 99 centimeters, for example. There's different ways of deciding how much that uncertainty is. Don't worry about that yet. But if I say 100 times 10 to the 2 centimeters plus or minus, remember those uncertainty brackets, 1 centimeter, I go, okay, somewhere within that. If I want to test out my equations with 101, see what the max, or 99, see what the min gives me, so I can see the ballpark of what I've got, that's good. And this is called absolute uncertainty. It has units. It's, a, it's an amount. Amount estimated, talk about that later, with units. Now you can write it separately with the units. Of course you could say 100 times 10 to the 2 plus or minus 1 parentheses centimeters would be fine too. Let's use 2. Maybe there's some reason, something about it makes it less certain. Maybe you can go up to 102 down to 98. Then your absolute uncertainty of course would be Two. Fine. I'm going to use that over here in the relative. So what's relative uncertainty? Relative uncertainty is your measured value with units always, otherwise we don't know what you're talking about, plus or minus some percent, what's that a percent of? Of the measured value, right? Some percent of the measured value. Now, how would I get the relative uncertainty if I know the absolute uncertainty? Well, here, if I take the absolute uncertainty divided by the measured uncertainty, then you get a fraction. If you want a percent, times 100%, that's equal to the relative 
uncertainty, and then of course you can go the other way too. You see that. So that means that if you want to get the absolute uncertainty, uh, then we can take the relative uncertainty. and multiply it times the measured value. So if you have one, you can get the other. You just go back and forth between the two. Example, here I've got a, an absolute uncertainty of two centimeters and a measured value of 100. So that means I've got two centimeters divided by 100 centimeters times 100% is equal to what? So that gives me what? It gives me my relative uncertainty. And that'll give me a sense. Is that good or bad? So e either of these are fine. And if you have one, you have the other. But for instance, if I say there's an absolute uncertainty of 10 centimeters in my data. And you go, oh, that's horrible. So no, I'm talking about the distance from the tip of my nose to the top of the Eiffel Tower. From here to there, I know that within 10 centimeters, which is like my fist, right? So that's good, right? If I say I've got an absolute uncertainty of 10 centimeters, and you go, oh, then that's good. And I go, no, I'm talking about the length of my nose. Uh, all right, that's kind of bad, right? So if I can tell how much that absolute uncertainty is in order to tell that, I look at the relative compared to the value. This compared to here to the Eiffel Tower, pretty good. This compared to the length of my nose, not so good, right? So we can go back and forth, and when we analyze this in equations, and we see how much the uncertainty propagates as we use them in calculations and how our uncertainty will grow. Um, we'll, see, uh, we'll see how that plays out. But you got that? You can cite it either just by writing the number, you'll see the, the sig figs and you'll see the number decimal places, or you can do it by citing a value plus or minus some absolute uncertainty with units, or plus or minus some percentage of the measured value. It's the relative and absolute. Okay, let's see how you use that in the next one.